Welcome back to the podcast, Christy Arnhardt. How are you today? I'm great. How are you guys doing? Oh, we're doing great as well. This is going to be a pretty fun conversation. It's always a great moment when we look at the calendar and we say, oh, we have an interview today. Oh, it's with Christy. Yay. Essentially, we have you on so you can get out of your system all of the things that John Lorden doesn't let you talk about because he rules with such an iron fist (laughs) he's such a skeptic what he's missing out on is what we love to uh, discuss over here we will try to look at this with an open mind you came on maybe a couple months ago to speak about the jackie hernandez haunting which turned out to be a great couple of episodes today we're going to talk about the philip experiment an unusual experiment is about to be filmed in the studios of city tv in toronto The stars of this show are eight people sitting around a table. Off to the side on a raised bench are three men observing the experiment. Reverend Lindsay King, psychologist Joelle Whitten, and Dr. George Owen, scientific director for the Toronto Society of Psychical Research. The studio director gives the signal that the experiment may begin. Participants lay their hands flat on the table and begin calling out a name. Are you there, Philip? I want to see you, Philip. What you just heard is a clip from a documentary called The Philip Experiment, and there's a link in the show notes. Welcome to Crawl Space. Lance, how's it going today? Oh, it's going great today. I'm super excited for the listeners to experience this conversation. You also heard Christy Arnhart, the great Christy Arnhart. She is joining us to talk about this Philip experiment, which is just completely mind boggling and just a word right off the top. Uh, This is a silly episode. Yeah, so in 1972, there was a parapsychology experiment conducted in Toronto, Ontario to determine whether subjects can communicate with fictionalized ghosts. Not not ghosts, fictionalized ghosts. Ghosts that are made up right there at the table. It is wild because it's wild. It's called the Philip Experiment and... Big thanks to Christy Arnhart for bringing this story to us. Right. And we just can't even contain ourselves in this episode. Just like explaining it right here in the intro is tough because you just start to wonder, why did they do this? They made up a whole backstory for this guy, Philip, which is so amazing to me. Well, I hope everyone likes it. Definitely let us know what you think on social media. You can find us at Crawl Space Podcast or Crawl Space Pod. But Lance, we also want to tell our audience about Crawl Space Premium. And if you want to hear this episode ad free, then you want crawlspace premium you can now get it on apple podcasts but if you're not an apple user you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm you get ad free episodes early releases and our weekly bonus show which everybody loves and it's all bundled with missing and dark valley two other shows from crawlspace media what a bargain and as long as you're out there you might as well go ahead and follow crime christy that's christy arnhart on all social media platforms she's at crime christy definitely worth a follow and she works very closely with our friend John Lorden, so you can check him out at Lorden Arts. And before we get to this conversation, we just want to remind our listeners that the nonprofit that Tim and I are on the board of is hosting its first annual 5K Run for the Missing. This is going to be on Sunday, October 8th at 11 a.m. in a little town just north of Boston, Massachusetts. For information on the race, to register, or to just make a donation for the nonprofit, you can go to PIFTM.com. Dot org slash run or you could go to run sign up 
Facebook.com and search Run for the Missing. And the registration fee goes directly to the nonprofit Private Investigations for the Missing. You will also receive a commemorative t-shirt with your registration and you'll be entered into a raffle and eligible to receive one of the many amazing raffle prizes. And these links will also be in the show notes. Hope to see you there. We're going to take a break real quick for a commercial and we'll be right back with an imaginary made up manifested ghost. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Well, the Philip experiment was actually started in September of 1972 in Toronto, Canada. They wanted to determine whether or not their subjects can communicate with fictionalized ghosts through belief and human willpower. Essentially, can you create your own ghost? Are we actually seeing ghosts as manifestations or are they manifestations of our mind and we're creating them? I like it already. I love experiments. I think this is a great subject to do an experiment on, albeit pretty difficult to have a controlled experiment when you're trying something like this, though. How did they manage that? Well, everything was recorded on video, on audio. They had people that would sit near the table they used for their seances that was supposed to be monitoring, you know, if someone was lifting the table, if someone was moving it or wrapping, anything like that. The video especially, you can't tell what's happening. You don't have clear views of everything. It makes it really hard to control the conditions and prove that they're manifesting this ghost. If There's so much evidence on these videos and you're like, oh, but I just, I need to know somebody's foot's not under that table, you know? I didn't know how to really wrap my head around how to approach this, whether this was a ghost story or whether this was an experiment with a collective subconscious. You know what I mean? I didn't know how to approach this because they made this up. I want to be clear, right? This ghost that they're trying to summon does not exist. The person did not exist didn't live, didn't die. This is all conjured by this group. The document that you provided us shows an image that they drew of him. Yes. It's it's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the, these people who were involved in the group, um, were they a, a group of psychics? No, actually, everybody in the group was picked specifically because they had no type of extrasensory perception. And when you go down the list, I mean, they're, they're really grounded professions that they have as well. How did the story come about? How did they create the story? This group of people would get together and they would have sessions where they basically sat around and talked out who they wanted this person to be, what they wanted his history to be like, what they wanted him to look like. They knocked all of this out like like a writer's room, I guess, and concentrated on him, thought about him, centered everything in their mind. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> I'm laughing. Uh, the the story's ridiculous. Uh, I I couldn't get past it. <laughs> oh oh, and I, please tell please tell me I get to tell this story because it's yes, awesome. Yes, please. Yeah, well, yeah. Go, go, go ahead into the story. Well, Philip's backstory starts in 1624. He was born in England, an aristocratic Englishman and a Catholic. He had an early military career and was knighted by the age of 16. He was involved in the English Civil War and was personal friends with Charles II because he worked with him as a spy. Now, Philip was unhappy in his marriage. He was married to a beautiful but cold and frigid woman named Dorothea, who was the daughter of a a neighboring nobleman. It's like a, a Harlequin romance. (laughs) <laughs> this is incredible okay keep i haven't going. even hit the good stuff yet oh. one day while he was out riding his horse on the boundaries of his estate diddington manor philip came across a romani encampment and saw there a beautiful dark-eyed raven-haired romani girl named margo instantly fell in love with her so naturally he just brought her back to his estate and put her up in his gatehouse as their little love nest he kept her secret for a time. You know, nobody found their little love nest, but eventually his wife, Dorothea, realized he was keeping somebody there. She went in, she found Margot, accused her of witchcraft and stealing her husband. Naturally, Philip was too scared to say anything. He didn't want to lose his lands or his reputation, so he kept his mouth shut. They convicted this girl and burned her at the stake as a witch. Philip was stricken with remorse, as of course she would be. He would stand up on the battlements at Diddington and pace 
and pace all through the night. And then one morning, they found his body at the bottom of the battlements, whence he had cast himself in a fit of agony and remorse. He was only 30 years old. <laughs> Poor Philip. <laughs> I know. Oh my God. It's no wonder that these people are not writers. That, you know, Al Peacock <laughs> is a heating engineer. There's a sociology <laughs> student, uh, a bookkeeper making up this uh, trash. This is a this is an <laughs> awful story. <laughs> the the biggest problem I have with the story is that they two out of the, the three people in the love triangle die at the end. They could have just run away and they'd both be alive. <laughs> I know. What, are we serious here? This is they. They want it to be like a Shakespeare thing, but it's just completely not. It's I know. Really why, why they have to? Why they have to make poor? Who is his <laughs> wife? Uh, Dorothea. Dorothea. Why did they have to make poor Dorothea like frigid and cold? Well, that's the way it's got to be, right? I mean, he was okay to have an affair, right? Yeah, for him to be a philanderer. <laughs> She has to be frigid to be that upset. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the funniest details in the story is the name of the of the place, Diddington. Diddington yeah, Manor. But that's I know. that's the only factual thing, right? There is an actual Diddington Manor. Yes. Cut the crap. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think while they were doing this they were like, Why are we doing this? <laughs> well, but sir, they were into it. Totally. Oh, yes, they sure were, <laughs> as evidenced by the video from the 70s. They oh, were yeah. having a grand old time. And let me add, that may be part of the reason why we don't have any good evidence of this Ulpa or really the experiment, uh, because the video is from the 70s and such. I'm blaming Al Peacock for uh, for a lot of this uh, story, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write fan fiction about Al Peacock, because uh, he deserves it. Okay, can you give us some of the details? details of the uh, first experiment yes the first time everyone was placed just in a room around a table they sat and they concentrated on philip they talked about philip they expanded on his story and history they did that for a year <laughs> and they got no results whatsoever <laughs> i have to interrupt you <laughs> they committed to something <laughs> that was fake for a year and they're like we're not getting any results like, yeah Let's keep going. Let's keep going. <laughs> so what do you do? You change the test conditions. Yep. To fit your desired results. Got oh, it. yes. They decided that a more traditional seance would help to bring this all to the fore. So by getting into the spirit of it, the participants seemed to get better results. They dimmed the lights. They put up candles. You know, they had them sitting around a table with their hands on it. The whole thing. They almost immediately started getting evidence. Uh, they would feel a presence in the room. The table would vibrate. They said that when they touched the table, it felt different, almost as if there was an electrical charge through it. They felt breezes. They heard unexplained echoes. Lights would dim and come back on as they asked Philip to change them. And they had a lot of rapping sounds. That's how he would answer all of his questions was by rapping. You know, they didn't catch any EVPs or anything like that. He would rap on the table. Like tap. Yeah, he didn't actually rap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rapping in the uh, Edgar Allan Poe sense, not in the uh, Tupac Shakur sense. Right. <laughs> I, I, I just want to criticize them a little bit here it took them a year to someone finally after a year was like maybe we should dim the lights you know if they're gonna try to recreate bringing a spirit into this world how can you not make it look like a seance they were way too analytical with this they were trying to be academic i think with they uh, were with their experiment and they uh, were I, I appreciate that but then they they see somewhere along the line dramatics really uh took over <laughs> It sure did. They even started to figure out what his likes and dislikes were. They had audio. They had video. They had witnesses. It was just ridiculous how much they had going for them. Then they decide, we're going to do this huge experiment, and we're going to do it in front of a live audience. So they bring in 50 people. It's set up just like it was before. They have their stage. They have their table candles, lights dimmed and all of that. And this footage is documented as well. You can find it on YouTube. Right from the beginning, Philip came out. The table was rapping. There were noises. Lights were blinking. At one point, the table fully levitated into the air and moved around the room. This is, of course, with everybody still touching it. This video is uh, is pretty weird, I have to say. And the, the adults in the experiment 
they're shaking the table like maniacs and they're yelling and they're ah, they're tapping and they're twisting it and, and tilting it. I gathered that they're trying to like ramp up their own energy. Is that what uh, what they're doing here? Oh, yes. Yeah. And to get themselves into the spirit of it, they would sit around and sing old songs like seriously, 99 bottles of beer on the wall. And they'd get into this fun loving atmosphere. And they felt that that helped their minds to enter a more childlike state that allowed the manifestation to kind of come through. Yeah. So that's kind of bordering on getting creepy to me, less experimental academic and more, well, we'll get into it later on but that concept of the tulpa is like almost terrifying to me and that's where we're getting now like it's getting um, right on the cusp there of this like kind of getting under my skin i am curious though did the audience of 50 know that this ghost was a manifestation of the group and not like someone historical that actually died yeah, I think everybody knew that this experiment was happening because they had a lot of skeptics there for the recording, too. I think they had one that was a, a priest or a preacher, and I guess they felt would help play devil's advocate. Now, it seems like the host of that TV show was pretty convinced that there was tapping coming from inside the table. But the audience, I, I would suggest, w was a little less convinced, being further away. You know, who the heck really knows what's going on on the stage, the lights, you know. But the host, I have to say, seemed pretty convinced. He sold it. All of the people that were involved in this, they were so gung-ho. Nobody's faking this. This is really happening. But unfortunately, at the end of it, I mean, they did this. This experiment went on for five years, and they were never able to manifest <laughs> Philip, which was one of their goals. It wasn't just, can we create it? When you say manifest, do you mm -hmm. mean a physical manifestation yes. of someone who never existed never lived, never died. That's absolutely correct. That's now getting into into real creep territory. Yes, it is. That's when you start getting into scary mind stuff. It's like you've become a 3D printer. <laughs> your brain is and your collective group have 3D printed somebody into this Ooh. existence. Oh, yeah. But so instead of like just appearing as some kind of apparition or possibly a solid person or something like that, we got a bunch of tapping, tilting of the table, possibly some levitating of the table. So some energy definitely was created or thrown around at least enough to have some bizarre results out of this experiment. Yeah, and this wasn't the only time that they recreated it. After the Philip experiment was done, you know, everybody complained about the control conditions. So they came up with other characters. There was one named Lilith, another one named Humphrey. There's been several. There was another one in Australia that was done in 2007. It wasn't even that long ago. And they were all able to recreate wrapping and things of that nature, but nobody was able to manifest anything. How could they if they if they haven't developed the right landing gear? You need the portal. They need to build the portal. They're not they're not putting this all together. Well, they need to bring the whole tulpa aspect into it is what they do. That will finish it all off. <laughs> right. Sorry, I'm being goofy. But how could you not be goofy? <laughs> well, I guess my, my real point is like, where do they expect it to like, it's just going to appear sitting at the table with them? Is there no other end to that? part of the experiment you know it seems like a little not completely thought out do they have like some altar do they have like some circle that they were hoping philip would appear in like obviously he was never going to appear i mean i i would say that they got very interesting results anyway scientifically they got they got good results yeah i mean maybe if they were trying to find a, a, an actual living person who died tragically or something like that they, they would have better results in bringing that apparition to uh, into the room or something. But a fictional person, that's part of this that is um, very strange. A handsome man, though, Philip. And you the think? hair, the beard. I mean, he kind of looks like Jesus, with a little bit of shorter hair, <laughs> maybe. He's got a like full a, beard. Yeah. A rockin' mullet. <laughs> yep. He kind of looks like, um, maybe like a little James Brolin. <laughs> Like he in reminds Amityville? me of Grizzly Adams. Okay, Grizzly Adams. That. But yeah, but yeah, yeah. from Amityville. Yeah, he does or, have that look. Or like Zach Galifianakis from The Hangover. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
now that we're talking about this sketch, like I, I, I was wondering, like, how did they each contribute? Because it says image of Philip drawn by group. Was somebody like, I'll take the eyes, I'll take the beard, I'll do the hair. Did they look it up? This was 1972, right? How do you yeah. research like hairstyles from when, like 1600s? I don't know. I don't think they did. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. But, you know, and I'm sure they all sit around as a group and they were like, oh, but the eyes should be shaped like this. And everyone was like, yeah, yeah. It kind of looks like Tim. Do you think? <laughs> Give Tim a big beard, like a bushy beard and grow out that hair. There you go. Maybe Tim's the manifestation. <laughs> <laughs> I am Philip. He just, <laughs> they he just can... popped up elsewhere. That can be your Halloween costume this year. You'll go with Philip Ailsford. Al- <laughs> people will be like who are you oh, I'm, Philip. I'm Philip man <laughs> I'm the Tulpa from the Philip experiment <laughs> oh god <gasps> and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program then the table would actually move it would glide over the thick piled carpet or even rear up on one or two legs only. Attempts to reproduce this motion by pushing always fail. It was impossible to imitate the table's spontaneous motion. Supposedly the table actually levitated during this TV show. I don't know. Like there definitely isn't that evidence on video. I'm struggling to believe that that actually happened. Well, they even said when they filmed it that it was so dark, the cameras were unable to pick up the levitation because it was only so many inches off the floor and people in the audience had trouble seeing it too. But the control people who were there swear table moved on its own. Much like a Ouija board. Well, kind of exactly like a Ouija board. It's the ideometer effect. You know, you're all sitting around with the planchette. You've got your hands on it. You ask your questions. Your subconscious is actually moving the planchette around the table. So that was one of the theories put forth for a lot of this is just that they were creating it themselves with their subconscious or they cheated. One of the guys at the table or one of the girls, they could have done something to cheat. Wrapping, cracking knuckles, stuff like that. Sort of a long... A long joke, you know. Wasn't it five everyone. years worth? Yeah, really wasting everyone's time. But I guess if they're having fun, uh, which they clearly are, maybe it's not too big of a uh, a problem. And we get some content out of it, so thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've read about this since I was a kid. So, you know, come on. This is most of my life here. I've heard about this. I have another criticism for something that you mentioned a, a few minutes ago. They set up this whole thing and they set up the cameras and everything, but the cameras couldn't pick up the table levitating because it was too dark. If you're going through the effort of like setting everything up and you know you have cameras there, why don't you make sure that everything is like nice and well lit so that it won't be questioned? That would be the thing to do. They got their best results with the dim lighting. It played well with the audience. Can't get over the fact that I think we just made a wrong choice in my professional career. (laughs) Like, just make something up and just say this is a thing now. But be careful what you make up. Yeah, it's going to be harmless for the most part. Well, and you put too much energy into that. You don't want to manifest what you made up, which is really what I feel that they did. I think they created a tulpa. Let's definitely get into that. Before we do, I just want to go through the rest of this here because it seems like the experiment was criticized pretty heavily for lacking i guess a controlled environment yeah it was you can see it with the video it's dark somebody can be cheating even with their test people standing around to make sure that doesn't happen there are other cases where poltergeist activity has been brought up it's people faking it they're like tossing a rock when you're not looking they're cracking toes and knuckles without you seeing things like that so that could definitely be a big possibility but like you said five years is a long time to carry that cracking knuckles yeah there were two girls and i want to say it was the infield poltergeist they weren't able to account for all of the noises and the things that happened in the house with those girls but they did catch one of them cracking toes and knuckles and they were like oh well i did do that some but there really is a ghost here what if they did actually call up a ghost or a demon or some kind of entity that was floating around out there and I guess bored and wanted something to do. Some bored ghost named Philip. Well, he could pretend to be Philip. They wouldn't know the difference. (laughs) That's true. So possible explanations. It's possible they cheated or fabricated this activity. But as we sort of discussed earlier, one 
possibility is that the participants interpreted the phenomena as evidence of Philip to confirm existing beliefs that Philip was real. Yes. So that's an interesting idea, sort of like confirmation bias. Yeah, and that one I don't so much get into. There were so many things that happened. I'm like, could all of that be fake? I'm going to say no. Yeah, it could be part of it with a dash of the next one here, as you mentioned, the uh, ideomotor. I think it's ideometer. Ideometer. Okay. We might look it up and see how it's pronounced. I don't know. And so this is phenomenon used to explain Ouija boards where the human body makes subconscious involuntary movements, such as a hypnic, a hypnic, a hypnic jerk, a hypnic jerk. (laughs) That's Lance's nickname. (laughs) <laughs> yeah suggesting the movement of the planchette when it's really not the case so that's kind of like your collective unconscious gathering and moving it on its own if you've ever played the ouija board uh this likely makes sense to you or more sense at least i don't know if it makes perfect sense yeah and it and of course you know i have so <laughs> <laughs> right. Another possibility is they, like you said, they really did contact something in the spirit world. That would be interesting. Could could have been a poltergeist or a demon pretending to be Philip or maybe not even. Then we get to the idea of tulpas. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about this. Well, tulpas are thought forms. It's something that is created in your mind and manifested through your power of belief. Tibetan monks are actually the ones, I believe, who showed us this whole deal. And let me tell you, talking about tulpas is a whole other episode because it is incredible how it was brought, you know, to the West and how it was believed in over there and how it, how it's developed into what it is today. Basically you meditate, you concentrate on what you want, whether you want to see an animal, whether you want it to be a person or whatever it is, you just will it into existence basically, through time and effort. The one story that I like the most, which is, of course, the one that brought tulpas to us today, that tulpa actually was seen by other people. A lot of times, the person who invents it is the only one who can see it. It's kind of like an imaginary friend, a more jumped up imaginary friend. But this woman was actually able to manifest a full-on person that was seen by the other people in her group on multiple occasions. It took a dark turn because tulpas can develop their own personalities. It's a a manifestation of your will and your subconscious. So you know what you're trying to put into this, but your subconscious puts in what it wants to, too. It started to be not violent, But he was just a dark character and it started to bother everybody. So she had to deconstruct him and actually tear him down so he didn't exist anymore, which is the same process, only this time you're tearing it away, you're tearing it apart rather than trying to bring it into the world. I need to pop in real quick. Was anybody surprised that this took a dark turn? It was way back, you know, like the turn of the century in the 1900s and all of that. So they didn't have the primo movies that we have today to show us that this is a bad idea. I can safely say that if I was alive back then and someone in my <laughs> circle of friends, even without the influence of movies, I would say this is going to take a dark turn. You manifested a human out of your mind. It's not going to go well. Well, and she manifested him as a monk. You start to think, oh my goodness, you know, a monk, this is going to be okay. He's spiritual. He's, he's nice. This guy ended up not being very nice. Yeah, I wouldn't immediately go to it's going to become evil, but that's exactly what happened. I I would. <laughs> this reminds me, there is an incredible anthology series called Channel Zero. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you check it out. It used to be produced by uh, Sci-Fi, and I think you can get it on like Shutter now. Season four featured a woman who manifested this tulpa whenever she was feeling like someone in her life was wronging her, and it was a contortionist clown. Oh, my god! It's incredible. I think it's called the Blue Door or the Hidden Door or something. It's season four. So this Tulpa thing, like, reminds me of that. And it's it's one of those, because uh, you just said they didn't have movies and stuff back then. But the concept of it never seems like it should be going in a positive direction. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is something to think about. If you're creating something, it's going to eventually take on its own personality and come, you know, to its own conclusions about things. Does it always have to be a human? You said typically it's a human. Like if I were to envision a giant stack of money. 
Well, <laughs> even even if people could see it, you wouldn't be able to spend it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this seems like a Tales from the Crypt episode now, though. Yeah, you'd get to spend that money, and then like everything you spent that money on would just come back to bite you in the butt. And then at the end, you wouldn't exist anymore, you know? <laughs> Or you're left alive in much worse shape than you were before this whole thing started. Like you have all of this money, but somehow along the way that <laughs> caused like the end of the world. Except you didn't die. You just are sitting on top of a stack of cash. <laughs> Nobody can use money now. You and Philip are just left there. That's all you got left is your manifestation. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. Dorothea discovered her husband's infidelity and accused Margot of witchcraft. Margot was condemned and burned at the stake. Heartbroken, Philip took his own life, jumping off the battlements of Diddington Manor. He was only 30 years old. Margot? Why, why didn't they want to bring Margot back? What do you mean? Why did they choose Philip? Like they came up with Philip and they gave him this backstory. And part of the backstory was Margot, the woman he was having an affair with, who's burned. I'm just surprised no one in the group was like, well, let's bring them both back. That's true. Well, if they're listening, opportunity missed. Maybe they can jump back on the uh, jump back on the experiment. Or what about frigid Dorothea? <laughs> Who wants her back? <laughs> We'd like to hear her side, too. I'm betting there was a reason she was so frigid. Oh, well, yeah, I think he proved why. <laughs> right. <laughs> so what are your thoughts here the the idea of tulpa very very fascinating pretty widely accepted as at least an idea i really love the that topic i'm not sure where i fall on it personally i love all this stuff so all right what do you guys think happened here i think this has been a successful experiment because we're talking about it today, and I'm not entirely sure why they decided to embark on this, where that idea came from, who, whose idea it was. Because somebody said, we don't even know if the paranormal exists. We don't know if ghosts exist. And then someone took it a step further and said, we should make up a ghost. To prove that ghosts exist. <laughs> to prove that ghosts exist. It's something that like, it hurts my brain to think about today, even with like all of the things that have happened from 1972 to today. Case in point, Jackie Hernandez. Like it's very hard to dispute some of those moments in her haunting. So they didn't have that then. You know, they, they were coming up with these things, but they didn't have the experiences. I think it is a really successful experiment when you're talking about the collective unconscious, like you said. What can we do as a group to manifest something that didn't exist previously, and how do we get there? And they found that they could get there through these, through singing songs and regressing, I guess, their mind back to a childlike state so that they yeah. could be more open to something, to accepting something. I think just as like a, a social experiment, it was a success. If it was a prank, even more of a success. Yeah, you're right about that. And as far as how it got started, I don't know where the original idea came from, but there were two doctors that were involved in this experiment. And Dr. George Owen, who was a mathematical geneticist, he and his wife, and his wife was one of the participants in the experiment. They were the ones who came up with the idea. And it just so happened that he was a member of this parapsychology group in Canada. So he had the resources to actually see it through. Also looks like a guy who could be a real gem at a party. Doesn't he? He's just that <laughs> stereotypical 50s guy with the, you know, the black rimmed glasses, clean shaven, you know. Had they completely skipped the whole Philip storyline that they created out of thin air i'm wondering if they would have gotten the exact same results i think you take that whole story out of it and they're still acting like children shaking the table and laughing and singing and getting into that childlike state still trying to manifest something and still do manifest something they never manifested philip to begin with so that whole part of the experiment, I would say, is a failure. But the rest of the experiment, I would call pretty successful, actually, even though it's not going to satisfy all of your peers in academia. It really doesn't matter who you're... There's always going to be somebody who can find a way to fake it or see how it was done. But I think that they would have manifested the knocks and the things that they did, whether they had Philip's story or not. 
I think Philip just helped them to narrow their concentration to what they were trying to do. Because, you know, I don't know, I just feel like we're more open to these things nowadays. And I feel like a group could sit down without Philip and still manifest something. Because I am totally on the Tulpa train wagon. I believe that they created, to an extent, their own Tulpa. All those people concentrating on the same thing, you know, willing it. I, I do. I think that they did this. But if a tulpa is created, where does it go? Does it have to exist at all points or can it go away after that? Because I would argue that th- this wasn't a tulpa, that this was some kind of manifestation of temporary energy that was brought there and then, I don't know, dissipated once their focus uh, dissolved. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I feel like that's what it did. I feel like it just dissipated because none of them were big believers in the supernatural anyway. They were not supposed to have any talents of their own. So it, even after five years, you would think it would be relatively easy to just kind of walk away from it. Well, does that hurt the tulpa? No, it would just deconstruct and disappear. If you get to the point where you've actually manifested a physical representation of the tulpa, it's totally different. But when it's just in your minds and when it's just because like them, none of these people ever saw Philip in any way other than what they wrote or what they drew on the paper. So I feel like it was a weak enough thought form that once they all walked away from it, they were able to just it was just dissipated. But if you're in the human form, then how do you then deconstruct it? I've read that you sit down, you meditate. You do everything that you did before to create the tulpa. You just do it in reverse. You know, you want it to not exist. You you tear things away from it until it's well, until it just can't exist anymore. It doesn't have the building blocks that it was created with. Now, when you have an actual physical manifestation of a tulpa, and this, you know, I've just read this in stories, and thank you, read it for some of these. The tulpa will eventually decide to separate from you if it has an actual human form. And some of them are strong enough to do that, especially if they're not deconstructed like they should be. For all you know, you may know a tulpa out there. and I might be a tulpa. You, you might be a tulpa. Be. I could be. Can we create a, a tulpa to help us with uh, editing these episodes? Yes. Editing tulpa. According to Lance, you know, how is that going to turn out? It'll turn out. <laughs> well, I'll <laughs> risk it. no risk it no biscuit yeah exactly (laughs) i think this is the only episode where we've interrupted you so many times (laughs) just couldn't keep our mouths shut (laughs) this is a great one to talk about especially with all the video footage and even if you just want to enjoy it because it's hokey and you know it's fake do it seriously because it's something else yeah, it's fun to watch. And you you got to see the way that the adults are behaving um, with the table. Mm-hmm. It's very strange. I can't even, I almost want to demonstrate, but it's not going to sound good on microphone. But they're all just like freaking out, just like grabbing the table. I know. Something to see. So what else are you working on, Christy, before we wrap up? Well, I have a little show that I do on Fridays with John Lorden. They are not on the website yet, but they're going to be. They're Right now, we're just running them on live streams for the audience, but it's called Paranormal Perspective. And of course, he's the skeptic who wants to believe, and I'm the person who believes all of it. Last week, I did Spontaneous Human Combustion. Ooh, thoughts on that one? Oh, I totally believe in it. Yeah, I don't think it happens very often, but I do feel like if the environmental conditions are right, maybe something goes wrong with your body chemistry. You know, there's chemicals in everything around us. They're in us and everything else. It's not beyond my belief that something could just go haywire and you catch fire. I live in a dangerous (laughs) world. (laughs) I mean, your body does have gas in it, right? So It does. Yours especially, Lance. (laughs) I am super gaseous. <laughs> that was definitely the most immature thing I've ever said during a recording <laughs> of this show. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah, that one was a good one. I did Black Eyed Children. Oh, I love that. Yes, yeah, Black Eyed Children was fun. good. Yeah. You don't believe in Black Eyed Children, do you? Well, I don't think that they're Black Eyed Children like people are saying, like they're their own little subset of, of supernatural. I think it's probably an entity. 
may, it might be demonic. I know some people think they're aliens. I don't think they're aliens. But they have similar rules to vampires. That's why I think it's more demonic because they have to be invited into your car, into your house, something along those lines. Nothing is denied entry like that in our popular culture unless it's a vampire or something demonic. So that's what I lean toward. I'm going to call BS on the needs and needs uh, your permission to enter, to cross this line here. Any entity that's not fiction or that's claiming to be nonfiction that needs your permission to take a step, probably not real. Because it, it, what, it did, how the hell did it get there in the first place? It's taking orders from, from whoever? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know either. <laughs> it's taking orders from everyone. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying that you don't believe that a vampire, for instance, needs to be invited in. If a vampire exists, it could probably just walk in anywhere and do its damage. Well, I think if a vampire exists, then yes, it can just walk wherever it wants. Um, I think only since vampires have been, you know, written about for you know centuries, that that's sort of been added to the the idea of vampires that they need permission. Something to make you feel better, I guess. Yeah, it's a fun, like, fictional element, I feel like. You know, it keeps you a little protected inside the house, you know. Well, then it also plays into Christianity and religious beliefs. If you're pure, if your house is godly. Yeah, that's a good point, too, because there are a lot of, in different religions and cultures, there are things that you'll put on doors or on doorways that will oh, yeah. prevent entities. I think part superstition, maybe, in a way, but yeah, it's... Mm -hmm religion or cultural for the most part. But yeah, a lot of cultures have that. What makes a house godly? I have always thought of it as you're very pious in your religion and very devoted. You have a lot of pies? No. <laughs> <laughs> you bake a lot of pies? I'm very pious, everyone. My neighbors <laughs> love me. I'm so pious. Oh my gosh. I'd eat pie all the time if I could. <laughs> number one pie. Hit me. Hit me. What's your number one pie? Cherry. Cherry. Oh, cherry's oh. great. Cherry is pie. great. Not a lot of yeah. people say cherry. Most people go with apple. Oh, no. Cherry all the way. It's like Twin Peaks. Got to have a piece of cherry pie. That's my second <laughs> favorite pie. My first is strawberry rhubarb. <laughs> oh, see, I haven't got to try that. I've always what? wanted to. Uh, seriously. Oh. I've always wanted to. I'll mail you one. <laughs> <sighs> I'll eat it. <laughs> you should make a tulpa of one i'll think about it it's downstairs right now on your counter okay i'll concentrate on it before i go in there freshly baked <laughs> well christy this has been another weird conversation that you've manifested here today Ooh. with us good one can't wait to speak with you again me too yeah let's see what weird crazy thing i come up with next 